Okay, let's go ahead and pray first. Uh, Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us to be able to take a story that took place 2,500 years ago and know how we can apply it to our age, <clears throat> to our time period, that we might understand some things going on. And I pray you'd help us to be sincere and uh, seek uh, after your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to kind of give a little background before I read this so we can see the big picture. Okay, Jeremiah was the last major prophet in a small nation called Judah. It's after the ten northern tribes split away, so it's a very small nation. And he was like the last major prophet in Jerusalem, uh, the major city there. So if you can imagine uh, one individual having influence and in, say, let's put it in northwest Indiana, because that would be about the size, maybe the the northwest six counties maybe seven counties and uh, there was one individual that had an influence over all those seven counties but it was an influence that he did not get good press everybody knew about him but they usually rolled their eyes when they heard about him and then God would give him certain words and he'd go up to uh, Munster and stand on a street corner and uh, proclaim these words and then he'd run over to Lake Station and yell these words out there and then, uh, then he would come down to Hebron and he'd throw out the words out there. So he's just a fella. He had a very small, very small group of people that did listen to him regularly. And so most people, everybody pretty much knew about him. Uh, but they usually, if his name would come up, Jeremiah, they'd go, oh, yeah, that guy, Jeremiah. <laughs> okay. And so he was the last prophet of Judah for about four decades. Uh, his father was a priest in a town called Anathoth. He was a personal friend of Josiah, who was a king of the last good king that Judah had. He was a personal friend with him. Uh, and then he warned several of the kings after Josiah, Josiah about their sin. And Zedekiah was kind of the last major king or the last king. And he would secretly pull Jeremiah out of jail. When he'd throw him in jail, then he'd pull him up into the Oval Office secretly and ask him, okay, what's God, what's God got to say about this? And then he'd tell him, and then Zedekiah would ignore him, okay? But yet he wanted to hear what he had to say, but then he would, you know, and then a prophet would speak against him, and he'd say, well, you're going to be dead in two months anyway. Within a year, you're going to die, and the guy dies, Okay, so he was quite an individual. He was not married, and he, he typifies a Jewish evangelist of the tribulation. And the amazing thing is he just might be coming back in the tribulation time period. That, that is a possibility where he gets another shot at things. So now, now with that in mind, we're in Jeremiah 26. I want you to follow along how, what God tells this guy to do, and imagine... You being told to do this. Okay, I mean, it's out there. You can see why he was well known, but yet unknown, as Second Corinthians says. In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. Okay, Josiah was the last good king. Jehoiakim's, Jehoiakim is a bad guy. King of Judah came this word from the Lord saying, Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house. Okay, so they had one Jewish center of worship. So let's say in northwest Indiana, you have one place where people would go to get their religious viewpoints. And he's telling him, you stand in front of it, in the court. And then, and speak all the, uh, unto all the cities of Judah. And then when you do that, then go out to these certain cities and do it there in case somebody didn't come to the temple. Which come to worship in the Lord's house, all the words that I command thee to speak unto them diminish not a word. He said, don't hold back anything. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord. If ye will not hearken to me to walk in my law which I have set before you. To hearken to the words of my servants of prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened. 
Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Okay, so the word Shiloh, you got to go back and find out what he did with Shiloh. Those people knew what he did with Shiloh. You may or may not know. Okay, and basically what he said, Shiloh was a, a town that was the very first place after Israel became a nation that they set up the, the tabernacle. So that was their first place where they set up a tabernacle. And he's telling them, he says, then will I make this house like Shiloh. And then if you read what happened to Shiloh is he destroyed the place because they did not do what God wanted them to do. So he's in essence saying to these people as they're coming into the Jewish temple, I'm going to destroy this place. I mean, that was real uplifting, encouraging. They were all excited about it. Ha ha. Okay, now notice the response. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Okay, so if you can imagine a guy coming in, he's thinking, oh, they're going to receive the words. We're going to have a great revival. I can send this uh, information to the sword of the Lord, and they'll advertise it. And then I could go around the country evangelizing and be a famous evangelist. Okay, so here he's supposed to give these words, and he's pretty much got a hunch what the reaction is going to be. And the crowd gets together and says, kill him! And he's all by himself. Wouldn't you be encouraged with that? (laughs) And so now they got a big problem. They got a big, uh, almost a mob scene going on. And they said, why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, this house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant. All the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. So it's one against all of them. Hundreds of people. When the princes of Judah heard these things, so it became an an uproar. When they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord, sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, then spake the priest and the prophets unto the princes. Okay, so that's, it's like the whole temple had a big fight, yell, screaming going on, and they had to call in the police because they were going to have a big fight. Some guy's going to get murdered, and here comes the police, the princes. And, and the, the priest and the prophet said, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against this city as ye have heard with your ears. And they're trying to get the princes to kill him. So it's the religious people pushing the police or the political people against one guy want him to die just because he said some words. Isn't that something? Okay, and then, then, then spake Jeremiah unto all the princes and all the people, saying, okay, so now he's trying to settle the mob down. He said, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city all the words that ye have heard. Therefore now amend your ways and your doings. Notice he didn't back off. And obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he hath pronounced against you. As for me, behold, I am in your hand. Do with me as seemeth good, and meet with you. And at this point, Jeremiah is probably so fed up, he said, please, put me out of my misery. I get to deal with you knuckleheads. God told me to do this. I'm tired of it. Okay, okay, and then he says, but know for certain, know ye for certain that if ye put me to death, ye shall surely bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and upon the inhabitants thereof. For of a truth the Lord sent me unto you to speak all these words in your ears. He said, okay, go ahead. If you're going to kill me, I'm I'm just letting you know you're going to be killing innocent blood, and that blood's going to be on your head. Well, verse 16, then the princes... <clears throat> and all the people unto the priest. Then said the princes and all the people unto the priests and to the prophets. Notice who's the instigators, just like the crucifixion. So the princes and the people are trying to talk some sense into the priests and the prophets. 
And then they said, This man is not worthy to die, for he hath spoken unto us the name of the Lord our God. Okay, and then when you read the rest of it, you see they'll give a couple examples, and Jeremiah doesn't get executed. Okay, now, when you read through Jeremiah, <clears throat> this could serve as an example to all nations, <clears throat> but yet God did deal more harshly Okay, and more strictly with Israel than he will with other nations because to whom much is given, much is required. Okay, so I'm not saying America will experience the exact same things that, that Jerusalem or Judah did because they were given so much and then God required more from them. But I want to focus on three entities through the book of Jeremiah, a very overview. I want to, and I even made it illiterated. So you're getting your money's worth if you put anything off. Okay, maybe a quarter. Okay, and so uh, it's the first I want to look at is the rebellious people of God and then the radical prophet of God. You've heard people say, oh, he's so radical. But they intend that to be an insult. And radical is actually a compliment if you look at the definition. Okay, and so can you imagine going... Over to St. Let's see, St. A's Rensselaer, St. E's Lowell. Going in there and actually get in, you know, somehow get on the platform and say, the priest's a liar. You are going to become popular. Very popular. Okay? And, uh, I mean, that's in essence what Jeremiah was told to do. That's radical. Okay? But yet, radical is not a bad thing. Sam Gipp one time pulled this. Okay, you ever go into a mall and they have like a, a sales pitch and about 10, 15 people sitting down and they're watching this video, okay? And then when the video closes, people is like, what do we do now? Well, he was sitting there watching this video and he thought, oh, I'm just going to get up. And so after the video was done, he got up and, and people just thought he was part of the sales pitch. And he just said, I just want to let you know that... If you want to know for certain that you're going to heaven, you and he told him about the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he quick got out of there before anybody could catch him what he did. I mean, that's pretty sharp. <laughs> okay, and uh, one time Bill Eubanks, we had him years ago. He got an off an airplane, and he said the Lord. He said the Lord told him to do this, and as people are coming off this airplane, he just sat there and did some street preaching for a while. He's picking up Janet and his wife, and so she's and he's just giving out the gospel at the airport and it was like the Lord said okay that's enough now you need to get out of here and so he and Janet just got walking down and here comes the security guards trying to get this guy to shut up I mean the Lord sometimes tells you to do some really strange things but Jeremiah that was out there what he did but first I want to look at the description of what were these people like okay so I'm just going to hit a few highlights here and there through Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 22. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to hit every one if we've got time, but uh, God said, chapter 4, 20, my people is foolish. My people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sottish children. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good they have no knowledge. Okay, so God says they're foolish. In chapter 6, verse 10. He said, uh, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears uncircumcised, they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. In other words, they're not going to listen. They're not going to listen. Chapter 16, verse 13, it says, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. Well, that's quite a comment about society. Chapter 6, 13. Chapter 9, verse 3. They bend their tongues like their bows for lies, for they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, then they know not me, saith the Lord. All of them are lying. It's about like a politician. How do you know he's lying? His lips are moving. How do you know the news media is lying? Their lips are moving. They're lying. Okay? And that's, that has infiltrated every realm of life. Every one of them are lying. 
Chapter 9, verse 4, take heed every one of his neighbor and trust you not in a brother. You can't trust anyone. I just got an you know, email from a guy. You know, he's been studying some things. He said, man, who can I trust? And I said, hey, you got to be a defensive driver. A best drivers are defensive. They don't trust anybody. That's not a bad thing. You trust the words. That's a good thing. Okay, and he says, and every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slanders. They will deceive everyone as neighbor and will not speak the truth. Sounds a little bit like our country, doesn't it? All of them are like that. How bad is it? Chapter 2, verse 23. Okay, it says, how, here's what their response is after Jeremiah said, you are worshiping Baal. And they said, how canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. If you haven't, why do you got a statue there? They refuse. They deny any wrong. Have you ever dealt with anybody that, doesn't admit to anything wrong? I mean, you got them dead to rights. No, 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 me. You misunderstood me. How do I misunderstand you hate my guts and I want to stick a knife in your back? How did I misunderstand that? Did I pull that out of context? Is that an unusual way of demonstrating your love? Okay, they deny any wrong. Chapter 2, verse 35. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent. These people are saying they're innocent. You want to know how far these people have gone? Chapter 7, verse 30. You see how far these people have gone. Chapter 7, verse 30. It says, For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, saith the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnon to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. Child sacrifice, that's, pretty, that's, that's quite a bit out there. You know, it's not abortion per se, but it's a form of it. Of actually taking your child, a child, to a pagan entity, to give him to a pagan priest, and say, if you burn this child, then maybe I can appease the god of fire and possibly get some more income this way. And then turn around and say, I am innocent. I mean, how deceived is a person like that? That's, that's out there. That's way out there. And they don't even say, what have I done? Have you ever heard somebody where they really did something that they can't believe they did in their life and they said something like, what have I done? What have I done? These people aren't willing to say that. Chapter 2, verse 5, you'll see that, that question. Chapter 2, I'm sorry, verse 8. The priest said not, where's the law? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not Prophet. Chapter 2, verse 5. Thus said the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me that ye are gone far from me and have walked after vanity and, and are become vain? These people have no repentance, no desire to know God, don't admit to anything, nothing like that. And, and Jeremiah is telling these people, You people, if you get right with God, He'll let, He'll forgive. He won't do what he's going to say he's going to do. Can you imagine the manifold grace of God? Now, here's some things these people did do. They believed in God. Chapter 5, verse 2. Ever deal with somebody that says, well, I believe in God. Like, that, that's good. Some years ago, a guy was getting out of the Jasper County Jail. It was on a Saturday morning. I usually walked out about noon, and this guy was getting out at noon. And he said, hey, would you come out and witness to my wife? I don't know if it was his wife or girlfriend. I forget which. I said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to do that. So he's getting out of the, out of the pokey, and then she's in the car waiting. And, and I just said, well, and he said, I'd like this guy to talk to you briefly. So I tried witnessing to her and witnessed to her for a little bit. 
And she pulled the, the you know, the, uh, I believe in God. I said, well, okay, that's good. But I said, James chapter 2, verse 19 says, the devils believe in God and tremble. I said, do you fear God? She says, no. I said, well, looky there, the devils are better than you are. She didn't put, appreciate that. <laughs> the devils fear God. But she didn't fear God. No fear of God before her eyes. You see, this idea of believing in God, that don't mean anything per se. It's just that you don't have to have an introduction when you hit the white throne judgment. That's all that it is. It's like an atheist. Who are you? Well, I'm somebody you don't believe in. But you can pretend I'm not here, but you're still going to hell. <laughs> I mean, chapter 2 or 5, verse 2. Though they say the Lord liveth, they believe in God. Surely they swear falsely. They believe in God, but don't matter. They're still going to lie. In chapter 7, they actually go to the temple. Well, I go to church. Really, that's, that's a good thing. But Jeremiah was told, again, here's another example. where Another time where God said to Jeremiah, I want you to go down to the temple and tell them you're going to listen to a bunch of liars. Boy, that would be encouraging. You know, go over to the uh, the, the new hot thing down there between uh, DeMott and Heap in uh, Wheatfield, the, you know, the first church. You know, stand out front there, you know, and say, the preacher's apostate. Hell, hold a sign there. You'll become well-known amongst them folks real quick. And a preacher may even come out, you know, a young fella, you know, and say, what do you mean I'm apostate? Do you know what the word means, kid? Do you know that your sign out here has got 666 on it? Look at it. Huh? What are you talking about? Look at your enigma on your sign. 666. Six, six. It's an esoteric 666. Six, six. Do you see that? And this same guy tells people, well, when you read a Bible, whatever you do, don't get the King James Bible. Get the new Bibles. Well, of course, you've got to get that to water it down because you've watered it down so much. I mean, if you did that, I'm not telling you to do that. But if you did, you'd get pretty popular pretty quick. Maybe kind of do undercover thing. You know, several years ago, uh, we had, Jan and I had went to a, a wedding in Chicago. as a Catholic service, Catholic church, seated about 2,000, you know, 100 people there. One of the kids was small, really small, started crying, rats. So I, I picked, I volunteered to take him up and carry him around the whole, going from pew to pew, putting a track in there and putting a track in there and sticking a track in the hymnal here, you know, you know, putting a little, piece of the paper in the holy water and then sit there and watch him come in. So we put paper in the holy water. <laughs> you know, just a little entertainment here on the side. I'm not encouraging that, but, you know, I mean, that's what, in essence, what Jeremiah was doing. Now, in chapter 7, look at they attended temple service. In chapter 6, verse 19, they actually offered sacrifices. Now, that's somebody that's really taking something kind of serious, I guess you could say. Chapter 6, verse 19. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto me, unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. To what purpose cometh there to me incense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. They even offered sacrifices. Put money in the offering plate. And God said, that's not good enough. You believe in me? Okay, that's good. That's okay, but hey, it still don't pass the muster. You go to the temple service? Yeah, yeah, that's okay, but it still don't pass the muster for me. Well, even you're going to offer a sacrifice? Yeah, that's, yeah, you can do your religious thing, but that, you're still not seeking me with your whole heart. That's what the Lord's looking for. In chapter 12, verse 2, they even spoke of God. They even talked about him on occasion. Chapter 12, verse 2. Thou hast planted them, yea, they have taken root, they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth, but far from their reins. Reins is like, it's another way of saying heart. You'll find that synonymous in the Bible on occasion. They'll actually verbally talk of God, but like Jesus says in Matthew, Mark 7, verse 6, they talk of God, 
but their heart is far from them. See, even though these people had a, a facade of religion, but their heart wasn't in it. It's in the, in the sports world, we call that going through the motions. Their heart's not in it. Okay? And the Lord doesn't accept these things if a person's heart's not in it. You know, sometimes the Lord will accept something that possibly is not done in the right fashion, but their heart's in it. Why? Because he looks at the intents. Now, these same people, when they have this siege come around them, okay, what happens historically, this Iraqi or Babylonian army comes around Jerusalem, they set up military camp, they surround the city, nobody comes in, nobody goes out, and it lasted for 18 months. Jeremiah told those people, he said, you're going to be eating your own kids. Now, that would be a real uplifting message in the temple. That's what he told them they're going to do. And they got so mad at him and upset with him, but that's exactly what happened. Everything he said came true. So, the rebellious people of God. The second thing is the radical prophet. Now, the word radical, okay, look up the definition. If somebody says you're radical... Actually, when they say that, say, well, thank you. That's very nice of you. And then they'll look at you like you're a real nutcase. Okay? And radical means relating to the fundamental nature of something. That's not bad, is it? Okay? Advocating thorough political and social reform. That's not a bad thing. Jeremiah was advocating a thorough political, social, or religious reform. That's not a bad thing. Now, God had him do some certain, certain things that were very strange. But when you get in a society, okay, the average kid has witnessed, if he watches a lot of television, he has witnessed about 18,000 murders, at least by the time he's 18. And when you have a society like that, nothing shakes him. And so God will go to extremes just to get their attention. And that only gets them real quick. It's only a quick thing. And that's how extreme God is in order to try to get people's attention. And that shows his mercy and his grace. And so he would tell these prophets, I need you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to go here. And the faithful ones did what he said. And Jeremiah was a faithful one that did what he said. Okay, in chapter 19, here's this radical prophecy he told them. <clears throat> he told them on several occasions, all your priests and prophets are liars. And of course, they never asked him to come to the ministerial association. In chapter 19, verse 7, he said this, I will make void of the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place. I will cause them to fall by the sword. He's speaking, the Lord is speaking through him, telling him to say this. Okay, you see that in chapter 19, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord. Okay, so then Jeremiah went and said what the Lord said. And so he said, I, the I is God. I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of them that seek their lives and their carcasses will I give to be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the field. And I will make this city desolate and in hissing. Everyone that passes by shall be astonished and hiss because of all the plagues thereof. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. How does that take place? They shall eat everyone the flesh of his friend in the siege and straightness. Okay, that's that 18 months where the food ran out. Everybody's getting skinny. I mean, 18 months of food supply. The king still got his. And on occasion, Jeremiah was in jail. They gave him bread and water. That's quite a prophecy to tell somebody. That's radical. Okay, and the reason why that, that's, it got that bad is because these people turned their back on God. Now, in chapter 37, Jeremiah is in jail. They put him in jail. They take him out of jail. They put him in stocks. They take him out. 
And in chapter 37, King Zedekiah <coughs> secretly went down to the prisoner or whatever and asked him, what's the Lord got to say? Chapter 37, verse 16. And when Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days, so he's in jail for many days in dungeons. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out, and the king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. In his mind he's saying, There is, but I don't want to say it. Or he probably thought, There is, but you ain't going to listen. There is. For, said he, Thou shalt be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. <laughs> It's like, here's the guy that's got power to throw him back in jail, and you would thought he would give him a nice, uplifting message, and he says, no, you're going to become captive. Moreover, and he didn't back off. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto King Zedekiah, what have I offended against thee or against thy servants or against this people that you put me in prison? <laughs> what I do? He said, he, he said it, I just quoted it. Why are you getting mad at me? God's the one who said it. And then you can read down through. I mean, it's almost comical at times. And then in chapter 15, Jeremiah got so sick of it, he just said, I wish I was never born. I'm tired of this. Everybody hates me. Everybody wants me dead. And in chapter 15, verse 10, he says, Woe is me, my mother that was, has borne a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole world. He got sick of it. He said, I have neither lent on usury nor men have lent to me on usury. Yet every one of them doth curse me. The Lord said, verily. And, the Lord, and he's like, man, what's the use? And then the Lord said, well, Jeremiah, verily, it shall be well with thee. And with thy remnant, verily, I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. And you know what the Lord did? But Jeremiah got sick of it. He wasn't some nutcase where he just loved to fight. He just did what God told him to do during a time period where people don't want to hear it. And he followed through. And God blessed him for it. You see in chapter or chapter 15, verse 15, 16, and 17. 17 in particular, he said, I sat not in the assembly of mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone. When there was in a Jewish temple and Jeremiah was just coming in to try to get something from the Lord, when he came and sat down, maybe amongst a bunch of people, they got up and sat and moved away from him. And here he was sitting all by himself. You see, and that's, that's a radical prophet of God. That's a radical individual, and that wasn't a bad thing. The third thing I want to show you is a remarkable pardon that God offered. The amazing thing is that God went to extremes to just to get these people to admit any wrong and come back to him. Chapter 5, verse 1. He said to Jeremiah... I want you to run through the streets of Jerusalem. I want you to see if you can find one fellow. Just one. He said, run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad place of their own. If, if you can find a man, if there be any that executeth judgment and seek the truth, I will pardon it. Now, is that not Mercy. Now, obviously, Jeremiah would have been that man, but it looks like he's looking for a specific man in the religious and political structure because you see the terms, seeketh truth, religion, seeketh judgment, the political realm. He's looking for one. He said, if I just find one, Jeremiah, you just find me one, and I will pardon all those perverts and everything going on, I'll pardon it. You just find me one. And there evidently wasn't one. It was so bad, there wasn't one. And all, here's all that God was looking for. If you would, chapter 9, verse 20. This is all that he was looking for. 
And this is the mercy of God, the extreme. Some pe- I've met some people that say, I'm so bad that God will not save me. Oh, yes, he'll save you. You just come to him. You know, I mean, his grace is amazing. And the person, well, I believe in God. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Well, I go to church. That's not good enough. He wants you to repent to him. Repent to him. Chapter 9, verse 20, thus saith the Lord. 9.23, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him glorieth. But let him that glorieth glory in this, <clears throat> that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness. Judgment. There comes a time where he does reach that loving kindness, comes to an end, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You know, God amazingly, in his grace, did all he could to try to bring these people back. But you know, there does come a time where God gives up. Three times he told Jeremiah, you read it in chapter 7, 16, 11, 14, and 14, 11. Three times he said, don't pray for him. Once he reaches that point, he said, don't pray for him. I'm not going to listen. I'm done. In Romans chapter 1... It says that God gave them up unto vile affections. Romans 1, 24 to 28, when God gives up. When God gives up, it's done. It's over. Now, it's amazing how far he goes. It's amazing how far God will go. But once he he reaches it, it's over. When God gives up, Forget praying for him because he told Jeremiah three times, don't pray for him. He said, I don't care. Chapter 15, he said, I don't care if Moses and Samuel prayed for him. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm, not, I'm done. I'm done with him. And then you see that he was done with them. And that's why around 600 B.C., Babylon came in, conquered them. They were without a country for 2,500 years. Now we see Israel. You know, Israel today is still pagan like Jeremiah's day, but God's not done with them. That's the amazing mercy of God. He's not done. And he is willing to pardon. Just all a person has to do is say, I'm wrong, you're right, I repent to you. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the amazing thing about God. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray that uh, we would recognize that uh, Jeremiah was a radical prophet, but yet that's, he did what you said to do. Wanting a thorough reform. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be people who sincerely seek after thee, and by chance if someone is not saved, has not trusted Christ, that they would recognize belief in God is not good enough. That doesn't cut it. It's faith in Jesus Christ for your only hope for heaven. It's honoring Jesus Christ for what he did at Calvary and receiving the pardon that he has to offer, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's just the starter as far as eternal life. But yet, Lord, you want us to walk with you. And, Lord, I pray you'd help us to be people that have a tender heart towards you, towards your leading, towards your word. Help us to remember that you are... You do want us to be thoroughly and completely following after thee, faithful to thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed with that.